Hello and welcome into Chi Time, your conscious living show with me, Clara Apollo. And we've got a, I know all of my shows are special, but this one is particularly close to my heart because it is the unveiling and the unfurling of the, the divine feminine, which is really a, a topic and a, a line of inquiry that so many of us are looking at, not just women. Some of the guys are looking at it as well. You know, what does that mean to be a, a man with a divine feminine within him, just as it is for us women to look at what does it mean to be a divine feminine in this day and age? You know, it means there's a real call to us really stepping into this more and more. And this episode of Chi Time has a top level guest. Megan Waterson is here. She only studied at Harvard. Um, the theology and really all matters associated with the divine feminine so looking at it through um, this topic throughout all religions and um, other arenas so we've got Kali obviously Mary Magdalene definitely um, and Buddhist uh, Green Tara but really what this is all about because Megan is also a top Hay House best-selling author of her book Reveal but also this one the Sutras of Unspeakable Joy, which has got loads of different kind of poems and pictures. And it's an absolute joy to work with this, to this level of study and integrity. But really, it's all about finding that divine feminine within you. So let's hand over and introduce you to the very divine Megan Watterson. Mm -hmm. So welcome to Chi Time, Megan Watterson. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. This is a real joy for me, a real honor. And a lot of people that know me will also um, be aware that um, I asked you to come to Bournemouth, but you weren't able to come this time. <laughs> and my lovely dear friend Claire Cortell has got me coming to Devon on the 25th of June, um, living that event. So we're just going to get a first plug for this amazing event. <laughs> okay. So do you not come to the UK that much? Is it something that is um, a bit special? Yes, I have a seven-year-old son, so at this point, I, I limit trips that are very at a great distance um, to a limited amount of time, but I love the UK. I have a sister who lives in the UK, and so um, once a year seems to be about right for right now while he's still a little man. Yeah. Oh, I totally understand. But but Europe is a place that you've been on pilgrimage to. Yes. I'm just in the middle of reading your book, Reveal, actually, and uh, highly recommend that to anyone listening or watching. And it seemed that Europe was calling you to yeah. to search the whole divine feminine um, inquiry that was yes. going on. Can you give us a little bit of an overview as to how that occurred and what you found and where you found it? I was actually um, pulled to go to the south of France, and I didn't even entirely understand why until I got there. Um, you know, that, that, that can happen sometimes. We can be so convicted and so moved from within. Um, we don't really get it until we've already lived into it. So I was in the south of France at this, this tiny little sea village called St. Marie de la Mer. And I had no idea before going that this was the place where supposedly Mary Magdalene arrived on a ship without sails um, after the resurrection and after she um, spoke on behalf of the resurrection, on behalf of um, Jesus as, as a witness um, to the court of Tiberius. And there's, in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, there's this great story of the red egg where she was trying to teach about how we are resurrected, how we are reborn, um, how there's an aspect of us that is eternal um, and that we can connect to from within. And she was using an egg to demonstrate to Caesar, you know, like her little object, um, her, her accessory, it was like an egg. And so she was teaching with it and um, he was very, very doubtful and said, the body can no more resurrect than that egg in your hand turned red and supposedly it turned red immediately. So in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, uh, an Easter, they celebrate 
St. Mary Magdalene with red eggs. But mm-hmm. so my, my trip began um, in my early 20s back then at St. Mary de la Mer, and that's where I'm being called to return to as well. So before I go to Devon, I'm going on a pilgrimage to the south of France, um, and I'm going to the one place I haven't been yet, which um, is, it, it gives me chills to think about, but I'm gonna be going to her caves, St. Baum, um, and then down to St. Marie de la Mer again, and Rennes le Chateau, and, and after that, I'll be coming to Devon, so I'll be fresh from a pilgrimage to Mary Magdalene, that she's the subject of my next book with Hay House. So it's, it's a pilgrimage that, um, um, has called to me since, uh, for several decades now. And, um, it's, it's one that I feel ready to meet with, uh, full consciousness. So I'm, I can feel how much I'll change in the process of, of visiting those sacred places. Wow. But you've already changed so much, haven't you? Uh, That whole, um, you know, your, your book, the reveal book, talking about how you were when you were a child and how sort of full of life you were and how through what occurred, it wasn't yes. so great. It kind of almost took that, took the wings out of your sails. And right. this finding who you really are through that personal inquiry into the, the divine, you've got that the divine is within you. And what's that phrase you said that when there's no, nobody else there, that's mm-hmm. where you're going to find God. And it's like, oh, it's right. so because you can feel so isolated on this journey, but actually it's that isolation that leads you into that bigger connection. Exactly. It's, it's that um, when you can be alone, that's when you can find that you never are. But it takes that, that it often takes that isolation and that sort of archetype of the hermitess, you know, that being in the cave or being up on the mountaintop, being in the convent, separating ourselves in some way. Um, but of course, in this lifetime, we're meant to come down from the mountains and we're meant to come out of the, the, the ideas and the places and the things that separate us from the rest of life and integrate and this is at least my path, integrate that which is the most sacred into that which is the most mundane, the most everyday. So bringing those moments, um, infusing them into the everyday. And what I found was it took that, um, that isolation, but we can, we can achieve that isolation simply in a meditation practice and beginning to understand what it means to go inward and to really listen so that we can discern a voice that is much more true and loving and real than any voice we could ever hear outside of us. There seems to be also a fear there in that stillness, you know, why so many are distracted and want to be distracted and are pulled into distraction, that to come into settled stillness is like, what am I gonna find, you know, how? How is right. That right. It's terrifying. I mean, in, in all of my years of leading women's spirituality groups and retreats and workshops, it's, I have never, ever experienced a woman who didn't meet with the truth once she sat down and just got quiet and just listened inward. And that can be terrifying. I mean, that's, it's, you know, everyone says that they want to know the truth and they want to find their answers. And the truth is, is that, um, it, it can be terrifying to really hear what's real because then we're, whole, we're held accountable for like, you know, we feel this sense of responsibility because once we know what's true, then, then it's time to take action on that truth. And so a lot of the distraction, a lot of the allowing ourselves to be pulled outward or allowing us ourselves to believe that there's someone out there that knows more than us, you know, or that the true answer is going to be over that mountain or with this guru or, you know, all of our answers are, are within, all of our answers are within. And that's, um, that can be very, very hard for, for some women just to, um, for, for men, for women, it's, it's, it can be a, a terrifying thing to sit down and suddenly hear what, what we've always known. Um, so, 
So, so that's, you know, that for me has, I've always been witnessed to that truth that w once we have the courage to just get still, we, we know again what's true for us. Yeah, yeah. And that there is such compassion there for yeah. the human condition and that I've found my own practice. Spirit never tells me off. It's always going, okay, you're back. You've returned. You've come back. I'm always here right. waiting. You know, right. So right. I think the terror and the fear just comes from the e ego mind, right. not wanting to dip into that truth of compassion and care. And right. right. And that's a great way to tell the difference between, you know, the voices that you're listening when you go inward. I like to say that my ego always sounds like a, a used car salesman mm -hmm. because there's this sense of like, urgency there's like you know if you don't do this now then this this and this is pressure. you know yeah. pressure and because the ego of course lives in linear time lives in chronological time whereas what you're saying in terms of the soul or the spirit this is it that's in you know in kairos in in soul time it's eternal so there's never any judgment it's like you know when you're able to say yes then then that's that's it. Like there's no judgment, even if it's in your last breath, like it, the soul doesn't care when you, when you accomplish something, just that when you do accomplish it, you do it with love. You know, it's the energy with which you complete something or the energy with which you move through the world. It's not any external marker or status or, you know, reflection of it in the outside world, like popularity or, you know, a, a big following on Instagram, like it has nothing to do with any of that. It has to do with the capacity of love that we're able to give and receive. That is the one and only thing that the soul could ever care about. Yeah, love. But also that call to trusting yourself. Yeah. How to trust yourself, where to come yeah. back into yourself to refer all this information yes. and that's what I feel you're doing with bringing us more into the divine feminine of being held is to actually really trust your truth trust is huge trust is trust is I would say the single most important thing to reclaim and recover is a trust in that small quiet unassuming voice inside of us. It is. It can be especially when we have had abuse and rape or we've been in situations where um, we've been really challenged to listen and trust that voice. Um, I trust is, uh, trust is really a bridge between uh, the, the capacity for us to really live our life from the soul, like from, from, uh, a sense of purpose and um you know it's what allows us once we then you know accomplish the great feat that is so uncelebrated because no one sees it but once we accomplish that great feat of actually hearing the soul like actually hearing you know what what it is that we need to do what it is that's actually true for us it's trust that allows us to then put that into action to actually become it you know, to, to validate it by making our life about that union, making our life about what we hear when we go inward, you know, not discounting it, not discrediting it, not saying like, oh, but that's just me thinking that, you know, or, oh, that's just, um, I hear that all the time. And it, it's the only thing, like I can listen to, um, women's accounts of abuse and women's accounts of, um, you know, having, having tremendous challenges in their life, but it's, it's when they hear the truth inside them and can't believe in it. That's, that's what truly makes me weep. Like that's, those are the moments that I really, um, and it all, it also is my, my greatest call in life is to help reestablish that trust. Mm -hmm. Um, because it has been such a huge, teacher for me it, it has been my one of my greatest spiritual lessons in how to love yourself I had a unexpected conversation with I thought it was the captain um, who was like this 
amazing flight instructor. His name's Captain Tom. And I thought it was him because I was having issues with my phobia of flying. And so I wanted like, you know, some support. And I thought I was talking to him. And I actually had somehow through like Hay House emails or whatever, I had actually connected with Tom Shadiak, who's like this famous director and he's a Hay House author. And I was on the phone with him and I didn't know it. And, and what he said was, of course, this was the conversation I needed to have. And his was the wisdom I, I needed in that moment. And mm. what he said, which was so profound at the end of the conversation was, you have three spiritual assignments in this lifetime and it's trust, trust, and trust. And, and I, you know, I wrote that with a red Sharpie on my mirror. Um, I still, and I still have it because that, that to me is, you know, that that's the bridge between that voice that we're hearing within us is more than just our voice. Like the soul is connected to the divine. So it's like, trust then becomes that bridge for us to bring it into our human lives. And in that way, we can be, um, you know, we, we can channel that higher aspect of our being. I don't actually, I don't want to say higher because it's equal to the human, um, you know, to place it above our human life is, is a misunderstanding. It's not higher. It's just as crucial as the human bit. Um, the soul can't be here without the body. So they're equally important. And um, for me, with my work with Mary Magdalene, one of the most important messages is that there is no hierarchy to the spiritual world. Like there is no ranking of existence where the divine is up here and then there's the angels and then there's the humans and then there's the animals and then there's the material world. It's that what love does, what the reality of love is, is a radical equality where all things are equally um, across the spectrum of existence. All, all things are equally worthy and important and essential to the whole. It's, it's more of a dance, right? Like I can't act on behalf of the divine without having this human form. And yes. that, so it's a circle rather than a hierarchy, right? So it's all, of, it's all of those aspects of existence working in concert, working in a circle, in a round, rather than this, we've really operated on that notion of a, of a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So I still have to work on changing my languaging because I often refer to the soul as like the higher aspect of our being, and mm -hmm. it truly isn't. It truly isn't. And I, I think it's very important for the dignity of what it means to be human to make sure that we really understand that lo love, when we're truly experiencing it, it, renders all of that equal, eye to eye with each other, energetically. Yeah. Wow. So get you. So that whole spiritual hierarchy and the spiritual snobbery that can occur as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, all of that sort of stuff. But you mentioned the word dance. Hmm. And um, I was at another Living Now event, this one, the lovely Rebecca Campbell was down in Devon last week where I, I was. And of course, you know, she's a great friend of yours. She was really yes. picking you up beautifully. And um, she loves to play her music. And one of the tracks that she played to get us all down and, you know, dance in our divine feminine on the dance floor was actually one of the tracks that you've chosen for tea time which is the aurora warrior one and i'd really love to play listeners that i don't think we can play it for viewers but for listeners and I just wonder what it is about that track or anything you'd like to say about that uh because it you know it's it's it is it is truly for for me the true warrior is one who can choose love who can find a way to love in each moment to love more to love wider and to let love reach where it's never been before that that's those are the marks of a of a warrior to me warrior of love and that's what she sings about so let's play that and then come back with megan waterson after that aurora warrior calling to the warriors within and and i think this is what it's not like it's not like we're fighting in a battle against anything it's almost like we're fighting for the right to be who we truly are against all the odds somehow um and that the us women standing up as warriors of love it's a different quality to it 
warriors and the quality of warrior, 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 can't even say it, men being warriors. Yeah. Well, I, I think, I think the difference, you know, energetically is that, you know, someone who's fighting literally like fighting against someone, there is a rejection of that other, you know, there, there's a complete negation of that other. Whereas, um, a warrior of love, it's more the, the energy and the idea of embrace of acceptance of, um, you know, love reaching even to, to them that ultimately there is no other, there is no other. Um, and, and that's, that's a profound, that's a profound difference. And the, and the, the other, the other energy or aspect of it, which I've seen, um, embodied so powerfully now in the U S, um, at different marches at, um, you know, with the water protectors, there have been so many men and women embodying this this energy of what what I experience as the divine feminine, where it's a love that also knows itself completely, right? No matter how this human drama is going to play out, there's this very rooted ancient knowing that we've already won. We've already won because we are the voice of love. We are the bodies of love. We are one and we've already won. There's that energy of like, no matter what you do, no matter what you, you know, no matter what plays out, how dark it's getting right now, we, we carry this truth in this ember of knowing we've already won because we're on love side. We've already won. So there's this, this unbelievable searing confidence, even in the face of like such seemingly backstepping, you know, and um, oppression and injustice. There's this, this like fierce backboned mm. truth that's coming through people that, that says through the eyes, I mean, you can feel it. My, I get chills just watching some of these warriors rise and it's just, it's this energy of like, you do what, what you have to do. You play out your story, but I know I've already won, right? Cause I'm, I'm love and I'm in, I'm in service of love and we've already won. <laughs> so interesting. Cause obviously you're over in, in America and how is it? So this is playing out now, isn't it? Very much that the old ways are sort of coming up to be really shown for the um, outmoded approach and it's right. kind of it's bringing the truth through even more because it's shining so much more brightly in relation to mm, the old ways that aren't really connected. right right and a lot of people have described it and named it as you know that things have gotten darker or things have gotten worse and on a very real level it's just become more conscious it's just bringing everything that's always already been there and bringing it into the light and bringing it into our consciousness, which is what has to happen if we're ever going to have a significant shift, you know, a collective significant shift in terms of the imbalance of uh, the masculine and masculinity and the feminine and femininity. If we're ever going to have some sort of it, you know, all of this stuff, <laughs> has to come up and out and into the light of consciousness. And I feel like um, it, that's a way of framing it that can allow us to feel more encouraged and not discouraged by what's happening. So this rise of the divine feminine is not just happening with the women, <clears throat> is it? It's happening within the guys as well. Yes. They, they are looking for new ways of being, well, it's almost like old ways of being who they really are and their relationship with women. And, you know, the great mother being our earth. And, right, exactly. And so you're not just talking for the women here, are you? Is yeah, no. no. No, I mean, and, and that really is crucial that... Um, that this this way of being is is one that's embraced not just by women but by men, by men as well and because you know a lot of people misunderstand that the divine feminine is about women mm -hmm. um it's not it's about a crucial essential aspect of our being that is male and female you know when when god created uh 
human beings. It, it was male and female, masculine and feminine. Um, so the importance of creating more of a sense of balance of what's sacred is crucial to, to both, to, to, to all of humanity, because then men, of course, are able to access the inner realms in the same way that it's been emphasized for women to, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's about the balance. It's about bringing, bringing us more into an integrated, even more than balance an integrated sense of wholeness. Yeah, definitely. But we are as souls and spirits, we don't have a gender, do we? So we get assigned a gender when we come down onto the planet for, reasons you know i what's the what's the oh, i don't know this whether there's this many whether there's more men or women on the planet at the moment i don't know if you know that or whether it is actually quite a balanced bag but when, when we yeah come into sort of soul work it feels very genderless but there are aspects to it that have this duality that we also are working with down here on the planet at the moment Yes, I mean, I've always found it profoundly limited that we can only, there's only two genders. Like that's never made any sense to me. I think, you know, our, our personalities and our expressions of being are on a spectrum and that so many of us are, I mean, I went to Smith, I went to an all women's school and it was like, there were women that were more masculine than a lot of men I met, you know, there, there were, it's, so this idea of two genders has always felt so limited. Um, and it's the, it's that duality um, that that feels so limiting. But what you know, I think, is one of the most important aspects of um, the work is is being able to integrate. You know, when I first encountered the goddess Kali and Shiva, what I understood that was so profound was that they are they are expressions of my energy. That I am both Shiva and Shakti. Like and and that it's important for me to really embody that and own that. So I'm not placing on a man what is actually my own masculine reality and energies to like that, that that's like, I can be my own man, you know, for my, and then, and likewise for men to be able to really be able to mother themselves and to care for themselves and nurture themselves in way that, in ways that, you know, many men, today really depend on a woman to do. And so, you know, a lot about wholeness can be that, that integration of, of seeing what our right mix is, you know, of masculine and feminine, but really uniting those, what we see as opposites, right? Because they're not opposites. Like they're, oh. they're, they exist in and with and for each other, um, but integrating them. Perfect. And, you know, having a boy child, I've got a grown up boy child. He's yeah. like 27. Ooh, wait for that <laughs> to happen. But, you know, very um, aware of when I was bringing him up, I wasn't doing the conscious work that I'm doing now. That sort of came a little bit later, though I guess it was always sort of there in the background for me around yeah. environmental issues yes. and kind of food that we were eating and the, the being kind to other people and those right. things. The, the basics and what's it like for you bringing up a boy because I was convinced I was having a girl it just made me laugh oh, me so hard when I had a boy it's like you little trickster <laughs> oh me too I only ever imagine I mean I, all I've ever done is study the divine feminine and you know I it, it just I only ever imagined having one daughter and that was it and but um I, I think the the profound blessing was in the um you know, the, the teaching that he's brought me of what mask, you know, how, how much we need to transform our ideas of masculinity because, you know, his like cuddling a little boy, the kisses, the like, um, you know, for me, I've, I've become a protectress of, of his feminine, you know, and not wanting that to be shamed or bullied out of him because he's a boy. Um, he, he is this integrated whole being who, you know, listens to angels. He's, he talks to Kyle Gray about his angels. He, you know, thinks God sometimes is a man, sometimes is a woman. He, mo most often he refers to God as a woman. And, you know, he's just very, very integrated and he can express his emotions. He'll say, mom, can I cry this out? You know, and he, it's like, I want, I want to, I am a protectress of that femininity within him 
that is um, so gorgeous and allows him to be like the fullness of who he is, you know, and not, not just this like hardened version of what it means to be a man. Um, and, you know, there's this very, very powerful quote by Marianne Woodman um, where she's talking about in conscious femininity, she's talking about the black Madonna, which is also a, a, a source of um, profound mystical support for me. And what she says is, when as a culture we're able to um, bring the black, Madonna, black Madonna's son to adulthood, like when we're able to grow that masculinity into adulthood, that's going to, going to transform the world. World. So it's a masculinity that has come through the uh, conscious feminine. So uh, uh, the the feminine conscious, and then the the masculine is one that's integrated that conscious femininity. So and 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 that would be the kind of man that you're you're expressing in your son where um there's the honoring and there's the you know capacity to be able to be with and not to have power over you know these other ideas of what it means to be powerful and to be manly or masculine um which don't serve anyone including the men no. so wow oh, juicy stuff megan waterson here <laughs> with us on she time running out of time now we've got a little bit of time left but um Embodiment, I really want to talk to you yes. about that uh, before we get on to what you're going to be doing for Living Now events. Yes. Um, because it's embodiment of the spiritual being is very much central to my Qigong practice. And it's something that I have found that when I am able to move and be with the presence and be able to listen within my body, I get such a wealth of information. And yeah. when I ignore it, I was going to say, all hell breaks loose, but when, yeah. it, you know, when you ignore it, you know, ignore it at your peril. And yeah. I just wondered what you had to say about the embodiment of spirituality and loving our sacred bodies, you know? Well, again, you know, the body is the soul's chance to be here. And we each sort of have to find our way back into being able to be at home in our skin. We, we all, that's the most integral and the most essential pilgrimage to go on is the one that allows us to be again within our bodies, like to be fully embodied. And what I mean by that when I say that is that when I hear my body needing something, I respond to it right away. You know, there, there is no lag or questioning or doubt. There's this deep intimacy. There's a knowing that the, the soul speaks through the body. And when we are moved, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but, um, you know, there, there are times where I don't feel like I am moving. I am being moved. Mm -hmm. I am being moved. And it's this, um, you know, I like to describe it as like a comforter and a duvet cover. You know, it's this, it's this feeling of my soul being flushed to my skin. Just this, you know, I, I don't know any other ecstasy, but that, that can compare. It's, it's this, um, it's this union um, and it's such a tremendous blessing. And then it allows everything that seems so mundane, you know, looking at the, the lake here that's in front of me or just meeting in the, the light in the eyes of another human being, it becomes what it actually is, um, which is uh, tremendous. And that, that, for me, I would say the most powerful revolution, the most powerful loving act and the bravest thing that any woman can do right now is just do the work that needs to be done in order to be in her body. Like just do focus on doing that work. Everything else comes from that. Like when, when that is established, you know, and uh, there's no judging uh, how long it takes or, you know, sometimes we have to have little experiences of it and then we're like, ah, you know, and we're out of our bodies for, for a while again. And, but whatever it takes, um, that's the most, that's the new hero's journey, I would say. That's, that's the heroine's journey right now is the, whatever brings us back and down into the truth of the body. It's integrating, it's understanding that there is light and matter. And that's what, we're, that's what we're here to do, is to really hear the consciousness and bring the light into what has been seen as less than 
and not holy and not sacred and bringing that energy, bringing that, the spirit, the, the breath, the chi, you know, connecting with it, becoming conscious of it, and then allowing that to lead us. It's very, it, that's, that's a revolutionary act. In <laughs> it. I, I have to agree with you there. And I love what you said about the soul being comfortable in your skin, right to the edges of your skin so that you're actually, you're, you're, you're a vessel all the way through. You're not, not right. just your heart is connected with your soul right. and your mind. It's actually the whole of you becomes a beacon and a, for your soul. And is, and is this sort of part of what you're going to be introducing us to play with on that whole day workshop on the 25th of June down in Devon? Yes, my, my main... Uh, focus are the teachings that are in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Um, really, really bringing those to light in the ways that um, allow us to understand um, what her message is, what her teachings are, and 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 then how we can apply them. And for me, it's been something that I refer to as the soul voice meditation, and it's a form of meditation that really involves the body, really involves you know, that effort, because as I said, you know, for a lot of people becoming embodied and really becoming conscious of what it is that is true, that can be a difficult endeavor that can be um, trying on a lot of levels. And so the soul voice meditation was something that um, I created as a spiritual tool to integrate you know, the experiences of soul I would have, um, mm -hmm. because I, I didn't want to just you know, experience it on like a Sunday or a holiday or um, when, when I was on pilgrimage, I wanted to experience it at the grocery store and, you know, like waiting in traffic. Like I, I didn't ever want to be separate from it if it was possible. And so that's, um, that's also what we're going to be doing is workshopping the soul voice meditation so that when women leave, they feel confident that they have that tool then to use to be able to reconnect to like as an anchor to drop back down into their body and, and really be intimate with the soul in a way that we stress, stress, you know, if we stress the intimacy of like our partner and love relationships so much in our culture, but what this exercise does, it's like, you know, um, couples counseling for you and your soul. You know, it's like, it's like this spiritual tool and this anchor for you to be able to really root into your soul and to be guided by it and to trust it. Oh, trust again. Yeah. Seriously. Yes. Well, I, so, I, re I remember that you did um, well, one of those Hay House organized thing where Robert Holden was, was talking with you. Um, I can't remember how long ago. It's probably nine, nine months ago. Yeah. What a dear man. And the, the connection that you two have, but, but you were talking about listening to your heart. And I tell you that has stayed with me ever since I heard you speak that, that, that quietitude and that just give that space. I can't remember what you said, but I remember the feeling of it that you led me into enable me to have an experience that then just stay, has stayed with me forever. So you're absolutely right. When you share this with people and you, this soul voice meditation, which I, I don't know if we've got time to do a little example of something now. Sure. Oh, sure. Great. Do you I, need, we have a few minutes? Are you sitting comfortably Megan Waterson here on Cheat yes, Time? Talking about recognizing your soul voice. Hmm. Thank you. So I, prefer to close my eyes, but this, we're going to do the, the three breaths. Um, this is the shortened version of the soul voice meditation. This is like a little taste of honey on the tongue for our day. So close your eyes and allow your feet to be firm on the ground, sort of press against it, and then have the sensation of your spine being pulled slightly upward. And then as we take our first breath collectively together, imagine that golden light is descending down over you from above, coating you in a golden warm honey light. And also within you, there's golden light that is spreading throughout your system as if your heart is suddenly pumping honey. It's warm golden light. So allow it to descend from the top of your head, down over your body, cross your hips, down over your legs and knees, and out through the soles of your feet, and feel the light spread 
from the tips of your toe to the tips of your fingertips to the tips of your hair. Just allow it to reach everywhere. And was, as we take this first collective breath together, we're going to set the intention of descending into the heart, which is ascending to a mystical space inside of us that is so much more than us. The heart is a sanctuary that exists between the worlds. The heart is where we can hear what's true for us and we can meet with what is eternal. So let's take this collective first breath together. And then we descend. We follow the breath into that limitless cathedral inside us called heart. And as we take the second breath, we know we are going to meet with the soul. We're going to meet with the truth. We are going to meet with that aspect of us that has no beginning and has no end. And we do this out of love for ourselves, which is love for the other, which is love for humanity. And we do this out of service for love because every time we dare to meet with the soul, that's what we become, just more and more love. So let's take the second breath together inside our heart. And now we feel a sense of merging with the soul. Now in this space, some of us receive by seeing images, like suddenly you're thinking about this interaction you had on a playground when you were three, or suddenly you see a, a moment in your life that somehow scarred you or marked you or called you. Trust those images, trust those visions. Know that that is what your soul is wanting to communicate. There's something in there that's ready to be seen or heard or felt or experienced. Now, the other way the soul can communicate is through pure emotion. Maybe you see nothing and hear nothing and, and, and you, you don't have a sense of even of presence, but you're, you're suddenly flooded with emotion. Just trust that that's what you need to feel and just allow yourself to feel it. Don't resist it. And then the third is, is voice, which I often encounter. All of these are forms of communication. They're all voice, but sometimes it's literally the sounding of a voice, not outside you, but deep within you. It's a voice that emerges in silence. And often the soul can speak in this way, in this very, very quiet, intimate, unassuming voice inside you. So when you're in that space in the heart, you can ask any question. And what I encourage you to do is just to continue asking questions. So if you get confused or you don't feel that an answer has been revealed to you, just keep asking. Be a very, very um, bright Barbara Walters and just keep asking questions until you feel a sense of completion or for however long, I'm an indie mom, so I usually don't have a lot of time to remain inward. And what I do then, even if I don't see a vision, even if I don't hear anything, even if I don't feel anything, I always, always give gratitude from this place. I always give gratitude because I know that which is asked from the heart will be answered. It just might not come in the time that my ego wants it to. So I give gratitude. And then the third breath is surfacing up from behind the eyes. Take a third breath together. And as we open our eyes, we know now that we are seeing out with the eyes of the soul. And in that way, it can be adjusted for as long or as little time as you have. You know, sometimes when, it, you know, my son was only two and I was writing Reveal and I had very, very little moments of time to take those three breaths, but they shifted the rest of my day. Because in, in a way, what they did is they gave my soul permission to take the lead. They said, love, love, you show me the way through this. Let me see now out through the eyes of my soul and allow that to be my guide. Um, and just those three breaths would, would then shift the trajectory of the rest of my day and what was possible for it. Wow. Huge gratitude to you, dear lady, for sharing that with us. Absolutely. Thank you. And 
We've run out of time on Chi Time. We won't run out of Chi, but I thank you so much <laughs> for your, your time. And if you'd like to pop over to livingnowevents.com for that event on the 25th of June, do do that. But also meganwaterson.com for lots more information about you. That's Megan with two G's and two T's, the Waterson yeah. bit. And you're also doing the Holistic um, Garden Party with lovely Sonia Lockyer as well. So yes. big up for that. I know that's in June as well. Yes. So, um, and I'd, I'd love you to come to Bournemouth at some stage. So let's see. If I would happens. too. I would too. Thank you so much. Thank All right, you. Then. Let's play one more track for people as we go out. What would you like it to be? Let's do Florence and the Machine. Let's do Florence. You yeah. got the love. Hey, keep your chi up, my friends. Thank you so much for listening and watching. Miss Florence. <laughs>